the Holy Spirit to guide us with everything we do. We encourage you, Lord, uh, Lord that those who want to speak, uh, Lord, that you'll have them not feel too shy to say something because we want interaction. But we do want your presence here with us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, hello, Tim. Good morning. So, uh, anyway, our lesson, I should say, this quarter we're focusing on what subject? Do you remember? Education. State of learning, state of gaining knowledge, and so forth. And we've t talked about ways that we can know God through creation, right? We've talked about ways of knowing God through his law. Today, we're going to talk about the superior, the highest way of knowing God through the life of Christ, and so forth. So I think you'll probably agree with all those comments. I have one comment I want to um, just read to you this morning, and it's taken from the book Education. And it says this, and you've read this before, the Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. And the creator himself was the instructor. And the parents of the human family were the students. Education, page 20. That process is still going on. And as we understand it, Learning to know God is something that we will study throughout eternity. So is there any end, do you think, of learning about God? Is there any stopping point where we have gained everything we need to know, do you think? He's so awesome, omnipotent, that how can we understand everything? But you know what? There's something more critical than just knowing something about God or an intellectual assent to him. Good morning, Mike. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you about Philip this morning. I'm going to have some questions for you with that. Uh, we're only going to have two or three questions today and so forth. Uh, so uh, anyway, hopefully we'll have some answers for those questions. You remember Philip, don't you? He was with the disciples from the very beginning. Now, before we get to verse 9, I want to concentrate. I wish we could get that. Now, can you read that? <laughs> I knew it should have been bigger. Anyway, let's get some background before we get to John 14, verse 9. Jesus, and John 14 is one of my favorite chapters. Sometimes I think we all have a habit of it changes every day, but we have favorite chapters. He begins, let not your heart be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many... Rooms and mansions. If not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. And if I come back, I come to bring you that where I may be. And then he goes on to say, and from this day on, you'll know me and the Father. And Philip says, well, wait a minute, hold on here. How do we know, where you, if we don't know where you're going, how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so Philip makes this statement, and I wish you could see that. If you take your Bibles and turn to John 14, 9, please do because this is key. There's something about Jesus' statement I want us to concentrate on. Okay, so what I want you to do is you look at that text what do you see in Jesus' attitude or his expression as he speaks these words? And here's what it is. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? I want you to think about that. Philip had been with him for three and a half years, well, almost. And he's telling Philip, You don't really know me. And what does he hinge that statement on? Let's go on. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? What do you see in that statement from Jesus? What kind of uh, disposition do you see from his statement from those words? Is he smiling? Is he happy? Is there something else going on there? Just from the words he speaks. If I pick up the mic... Maybe people won't respond at all. <laughs> but 
<laughs> but we want people to hear you. Uh, what do you see in that statement? And I'll be honest with you, when I looked at that, Beverly, you have to say something? Yeah. He just couldn't believe it because he was almost ready to be crucified and, um, you know, for him not to know me, he must have thought, boy, I've only got a few days left. How could they still not know me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jesus was saying, and then, I mean, see if you agree with this, he's saying, if you see me and don't see the Father, you don't know me. Is that what he was saying? Ooh. Right? Let's take a look at this statement here. I think you can see this one, I hope. This is from the pulpit commentary, and it's an interesting statement, and then we'll go to another one. There is no right understanding of Jesus Christ until the Father is actually seen in him. That's what the text says. He is not known in his humanity in, until the divine personality flashes through him on the eyes of faith. We do not know any man until we know the best of him. We believe in faith, don't we? A uh, pastor three, uh, three or four weeks ago talked about faith, and he used one word, which is so many words to define faith. He used the word trust. And that probably encompasses faith about as good as any single term, wouldn't you agree? And so, in essence, you can't trust someone till you know the best of them. Does that help us in the sanctification process? The process of sanctification is the process of learning to know God and trust him. That's a big thing what we're doing here. When you put everything on the line for God and you say, you know, I believe in salvation. I believe in his forgiveness. I believe that he's going to give me the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe he'll give me repentance. I think he'll do all these things. He'll give me assurance. He'll give me peace. Do you believe those promises or not? Sometimes we hear Christians and we're not sure they do. It's like there's always that doubt or that question and so forth. But as we grow, we become more confident, right? I got to tell you a story. Robert, you want to tell this one? You've heard it 13 times. So interrupt me if I'm telling my own story wrong. Knowing God. Story is taking us back to the valley of Shenandoah. And in that valley, there was a family. Three sons and one daughter. And it was a huge plantation. And we'll just call... Tom Johnson was the owner of that plantation and father of those children. And his daughter, who was about 19 at that time, or 20, was dating a Confederate officer. This was during the time of the war between the states. Historians don't like the term civil war. Did you know that? See, they get the war between the states. Okay? So anyway, back in those days, maybe that hasn't happened to you dads, if you're going to marry the daughter, you have to call dad, right? It's not, it's not all that easy. Did you do that, Mark? I did not you know. violated that policy. I, I, all right, all right. So anyway, uh, so the soldier went up to the house, knocked on the door, and Tom was kind of a tough guy. His wife had died a few years before, and he was pretty hardened, and he would not get involved in the war. He wasn't for the north, and he wasn't for the south. He said, I don't want to be involved. So the Confederate officer comes up, and the, he had a servant there. He opened the door, and he said, I am, I'm, I'm Tom, uh, I should say, I'm uh, Bob Ronson, and I want to speak with, with Tom, Mr. Johnson. And he said, well, hold on a minute, and I'll see. So he goes in there and comes back, and he says, uh, yeah, Bob, he'll see you. So he walks into the room somewhat fearful, and uh, Tom's sitting at his desk, and he looks up at him, and the first thing he says to him is not, hi, how you doing? He says, sit down. I don't like to be looking up at people when I'm talking to them. So, you know, anxiety is heightened. And so, uh, anyway, he looks at him, and he says, what can I do for you, Bob? He says, well, Mr. Johnson, he said, uh, I'll get right to the point. He said, I'd like to take your daughter's hand. And Tom says, well, you've been doing that already. Why are you asking now? No, no, no. He said, I, I don't mean that. He says... I'd like to marry your daughter. And Mr. Johnson says, why? Why? And he said, well, the officer got up and stood tall and says, because I love her. Tom looked up at him and he stood up. He said, well, that's not good enough. What the boy? 
And he said, son, I want to tell you something. He said, before you can love, you must like. And he said, you know, Millie, my wife, she died a few years ago, as you know. And you know, after we'd been married a few years, one day I was standing out looking out the window, and she was still sleeping, and I looked in her bed. And I realized as I watched her there sleeping that I loved her. Well, we could have a play of semantics here, but the process is trusting is a process, is it? How do we expect a new believer to be complete in his knowledge of God when he's new? He has a little bit, for fear is the beginning of the knowledge of God, but perfect love casts out fear. The process of sanctification is to know God. That's what our whole quote is about. What is the ramifications of not knowing God? Sometimes we focus on things that aren't really that important and forget the things that are. And so, Jesus was disturbed by Philip's response. He was disturbed. In fact, his response was much stronger than his response to the rich young ruler who bowed dropped his head when Jesus said, give everything where you have and, and join me. He asked him to be one of the 12. And he walked away. Jesus was more firm with Philip in his response. Why? Well, nope. Let's go to the next slide. This is from Eliot's commentary. And I love Eliot's commentary. It's got some great remarks in it. But I want you to see this one. There is in our Lord's words a tone of sadness and warning. The utter, the loneliness of holiness and greatness which is not understood. The close of life as at hand. This episode with Philip was just before Gethsemane. And Philip, who had followed him from the first, shows by this question that he, he did not even know what the work and the purposes of that life had been. They speak to all Christian teachers, thinkers, and workers. There is a possibility that men should be in the closest, there is a possibility that men should be in the closest apparent nearness of Christ and yet have never learned the meaning of the words that constantly hear and utter and have never, never truly known the purpose of Christ's life. That's scary. Okay? And I think Philip was sincere. I think Philip was honest. And he gave a response. That was what his question was. But Jesus was disappointed. And that's why we talk about education today, is a knowledge of Christ is of vital importance above every Thing else on the ten virgins when the five who had had no oil and the five that did and trimmed their lamps the five came back later after looking for oil and there was only one reason that Jesus did not let them in that door do you remember what it was what did he say to them I don't know you right why is that so important I mean all of us probably would say one way or the other, I believe in Jesus and I believe all the things about him. Okay? Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 that there would be many who would come in his name. Just because we use the word Jesus doesn't mean that we're one of his followers. Now, I don't want to sit here today and tell you that accepting the gospel is hard. Jesus made it pretty easy. And so forth for us to do that. And he made it easy because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So let's go on. I want you to think about this thing about knowledge. And let's go to the next slide. Jesus is praying in John the 17th chapter. Now I want you to look at this text and I'm going to throw something back at you. You know this one. This is John chapter 17, verse 3. Just at the edge of Jesus walking into Gethsemane. And here's what he says. After Jesus said this, he is praying, and he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. There was an interchange of glory here. If we glorify Christ, we're glorifying the Father. If we glorify the Father, we're glorifying Jesus, because who sent Jesus? The Father. 
Why? Because he had the same love. He had the same dedication. He had the same caring and so forth. He is the same. For all you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now here's the key. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is a powerful statement. What is it telling you or what is essential for eternal life? In fact, it's the only thing that's essential. You agree? Do I know God intimately? And if I know Jesus, because he is a living example of what the Father is like, how do we have a relationship with God that is intimate? What do we have to do? What is the result of that? Anyone? Okay, Mark. I'll hold it so you don't get contaminated. Yeah, I'm, I just know an intimate relationship is one that includes time. And I know when I was dating my wife, and now even in marriage, um, spending time together is absolutely critical in, a, in an intimate relationship. Okay. I think marriage is the appropriate example to use in most cases. And no marriage is perfect. Every marriage has its issues. But the point is, is that we grow together. Now, you know what my folks, uh, uh, and, and my wife, uh, wife's parents too, Carol and I get in the car, she sit right beside me. You know, we didn't have uh, bucket seats then. We had a bench seat, right? So I'm sitting here, and she's as close as she can get. Her dad came up to me one day, and he said, do you ever notice how uh, my wife and I sit? I said, well, I really never paid any attention. He said, she's on the far right-hand side, I'm on the left. He said, that'll come. <laughs> well, it is quite true that it did come that way. She's now at the far right, and I'm at the far left. <laughs> what happened to the relationship? It's deeper. Plus, she's going home with me anyway, so what's the point? <laughs> See, we got, a, we got I got that picture. <laughs> Love, as we talk about Tom, is not so cheap in relationship that it can be gained in a day or two. It is a continuing growth, okay? And it starts with romance. Hopefully, romance stays ill, although there is the story of the man who bought some cruise tickets, and he came home to his wife, and he said, you know what? He said, I want to tell you something right now, that I bought cruise tickets. She says, well, why? He says, well, because they say it's romantic. And she said, well, why are we going? So we want to keep romance, but it changes. It becomes more of an internal love, does it not? It comes from the outside. Let's say, what are we attracted for when we first meet someone? They may be pretty, you like their disposition, they do things you like to do, and vice versa. And a lot of it is outside. But as we grow in marriage, it begins to grow inside. And Jesus says it's not the outside part of the first meeting with Jesus fulfills the beginning of knowledge of God. It's the inside motivating power of God, which is love, that will bring you close to me and cast out fear. We're going to try to get to that point later. We may not now. Okay? Um, all right. So, as we talk about knowledge, oh, brother. All right, well, we'll just repeat the text. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Now, the Jewish people were very proud of their heritage, would you say? And why were they so proud of their heritage? What is it they could look back on and say, wow, we have to be the people of God. What was it? Some of the things that made them special, at least in their mind, right? I'll help you. We are the children of Abraham. Oh, that sets us aside. We have the great lawgiver, which was Moses. We actually, as a people, receive the Ten Commandments. I don't see the Gentiles around, right? So they had this heritage. And it was a good heritage, but they misused it, as we can do, and so forth. So anyway, when Jesus was giving his message of love and grace, putting the law in its proper perspective and where it works in the plan of salvation, we talked about that two weeks ago, 
The Jews knew, even though they practiced that, you know, at the end of life, if you had 12 good deeds and seven bad ones, you probably were good. But if it was nine to two, the other way, you were in trouble. So we're keeping count here, making sure we got the numbers good. They knew you couldn't be perfect. They knew that. So those who became Christians had a concern. When Jesus talked about the works of God, he talked about, look at what I'm doing. Remember he told John the Baptist, are you the Messiah or not? Go back and tell him what I'm doing. Right? What was he doing? He was preaching. He was healing. He was feeding. He was doing all of those things and giving the gospel. Right? He's doing all those things. And so they said, you know what? He's such a man of love. I, I can't do that. I mean, I, I, I can't really function like he's functioning. So they ask two questions. And they ask him, what work must we do that we can do the works of God? How many works are we talking about? Two. And Jesus answered them this way. He said, the work that you must do, this is our responsibility, is to know the one whom the Father has sent. What did Jesus say in his prayer of John 17, verse 3? What is most important? To know the Father and to know his Son. Jesus said the same thing. He said, now the works of God are to live out the Christian life. He said, I don't want you focusing on that. I want you focusing on trusting me. Now why would he say that? Why is that so important? And what do we normally do in opposite of that? Don't we reverse it? Because you see, I know, we all work. Well, I'll just show you. Being a dean counts, right? Yeah. yeah. We all work or have worked. And everything we do is based upon performance. Is that true? You go to school, it's based on your performance. Mark gets an A, I get an F, I flunk, he passes. Is that fair? Apparently so. Okay? So, it's based on performance. So it's very natural for us. When we're excited in truth, we come to Jesus, we're forgiven of our sins, and we say, all right, I've got to clean my act up. That's a natural, normal thing, but I will tell you this, it is the carnal nature that's giving us that information. That's the way of the world. So when we talked about John 15, Jesus tells us, you know what, if you want to produce fruit, which is love, you need to be do something. It's the same thing he said in John 6, verses 28 and 20. What do we have to do? The Bible, time after time, says the same thing. It uses the term believe. I've heard more people criticize that. Oh, no, 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 no. It's more than that. Well, I beg your pardon. It isn't. That's what the Bible says, okay? Well, what is belief? Belief is trust, as our pastor used about three weeks ago or four weeks ago. He used that one term. I love that term because that encapsulates what faith really is. And so God is saying, look. I want you to behave and perform the way I did. I don't want you to perform like the Pharisees. I don't want you to be hard-hearted. I don't want you to be judgmental. I want you to be gentle. I want you to attract those by the way I did it. But you're going to have to do it the way I did it. Jesus said the works I do are not my works, but the works of who? The Father. Now why? Could he have done it on his own? Could he have done and lived his life without the Father's help? Yes, that was his temptation. When he was threatened to turn that in the wilderness and all those sins, what happened? He had this rock on it. He said, turn that into bread. Well, there's nothing wrong turning into bread. There's nothing there that's a problem, except it requires Jesus to do what? Do it for himself. And when you know you can do it by yourself, because some people still do, but Jesus knew he could do it. And yet, he had to put that aside and rely on the Father's power. So, we see a little different glance of when we talk about knowledge, the knowledge of God, is that we are some, too many times, I have done it when I, was, when I was a new believer, and sometimes it creeps back, as I try to work on my performance. And that's a dead-end road. When we see that we're struggling with sin or we're having, the Bible tells us the purpose of law is to push us where? To the throne of grace. Because that's where there's power. That's where we gain knowledge of Jesus. 
That's what we get his love. Love is the primary motivator for the Christian. Oh, it should be. Would you agree? That's a good motivator. That's a strong motivator. That's a powerful motivator. But it has to grow. As Mr. Tom said to the young Confederate officer, you got to like before you can love. All right. So the work of God is to do one thing. That's all he's asking of us. He's saying, spend time with me. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I want to ask you a question. How do we diligently seek Jesus? Because that's the key to education. How do we do that? Sometimes when I pick up the mic, it works better. See, if you don't answer, then I have to give my answer, and that's not always good. All right? So... Somebody would ask you today, what do we have to do in order to diligently seek Jesus? What do we have to do? What's required in that? Beverly's not ashamed. Go. Spending time with him praying and studying uh, the Bible. Okay, studying scripture. Now some people say, oh, studying scripture. My dad had an eighth grade education, and when he became a Christian, he didn't like to read. I felt bad for him. I liked to read. Dad didn't like to read. Why? Because he had trouble reading. So I got him a modern translation. I gave it to him. I want to tell you today, and I'm not ashamed to say it, I am thankful for modern translations. Are you? We can understand the Bible better now than we ever have in the past. We shouldn't frown on that. We should be happy. Isn't that right? So anyway, let's take that. We're spending time in his word. Now, would you say the Jewish leaders spent time in the word? Well, you say, well, that didn't work for them. Jesus gave a reason why it didn't work. He said, you search the scriptures in order that you might find eternal life. But I tell you that the scriptures testify of me. When we study the Bible for intellectual assent, when we study the Bible for other than searching for the person of the Bible, we lose the benefit of study. And Jesus was trying to tell them that. What happened to the Pharisees? They focused on externals right how good they were and he talks about prayer now Beverly you mentioned prayer how important is prayer okay I would tell you this when I first became a Christian prayer was one of the most difficult forms of communication you know when you talk to people I'm talking to Mark right now or I talk to Beverly and some of you I'm Tom over here I talk to him you know I'm you know but Jesus when I talk to him it's different now, my dad, uh, when he became a Christian, you know, I was so proud of him. He was shy. He was afraid to say anything. Uh, and he didn't lose, lose that. But when you started talking about Jesus, and you started talking about the second coming, he is right on first base, right? I told dad, we'll have to give you a PhD here pretty soon. You keep this up, and so forth. But he told me one day, he was going to church. He said, yeah, sometimes they ask me to pray, and I don't, I don't like to pray in public. I said, it's all right. Jesus didn't condemn us for praying in public. He said, you better have private prayer. That's where he put his emphasis. Isn't that right? The emphasis is having good, positive, closet prayer. Would you agree? Why is closet prayer so valuable? Jesus is the one that says, close the doors, block the, block the pathways and the open ways. Pardon? Distraction is one. That's good. Okay, no distraction. What else? Not to make us all, not to make us all uncomfortable, but in a marriage, the most private intimacy occurs in private. There you go. You know what I mean? Oh, that is good. It doesn't have to be. Isn't that good? Intimacy is private between two people. That's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. God created that. That's a wonderful thing. That's why he doesn't want to share with everybody else. Right? That's special. That's holy, that's right, that's good, and so forth. So, Jesus is really telling us in this way that, you know, spend time with me. Intimate means, have you ever been ashamed to come to the throne of grace and admit what you have done? Come on. If it'll help you in steps to Christ, the Lord says many times. Not a few, not once in a while. Many times we'll come to the throne of grace. You want to finish it? Ashamed of what? All conduct. Now, conduct's important because people look at us knowing that we're Christians. 
And when you do something that's unchristian, they'll run to the bank with it. So performance is important. I don't want to say that it isn't, because it is. Because other people make judgments based upon outward activity. And that's scary to me. But Jesus said, I know that's a problem, but you're not going to be able to achieve what we need to achieve unless you have intimate relationship with me. I will take care of the fruit. Do you believe that? Too many times we say, no, we don't. We don't buy it. Jesus said, if you stay connected to me in John 15, 5 through 8, you will produce what? Would you say that's a warranty or a guarantee? It is. And you say, well, I'm just, I'm just not getting there. You're going to feel that way till Jesus comes. The closer we get to him, the more we feel we're not worthy. It isn't reversed. But we're worthy in God's sight because of the fact we've taken his righteousness. And that's why Paul says, and I believe it's in Romans, the 12th chapter, 10th chapter, when he said, you know, my people were zealous for God, but they lacked knowledge. They lacked education, right? What did they lack? They tried to establish a righteousness of their own. We hear that all the time, and we just seem we can't get it because it's hard. We're proud people. We got we to gotta make sure that we've earned our way. And God says it doesn't work that way. Maybe it works that way, it works, but it doesn't work that way with the gospel. And you'll soon find out. Okay, let's go on. Tim, you'll have to finish this lesson because it looks like I'm about uh, two hours behind, so forth. And so, now this is a statement that I want you to remember. And this comes from George Knight's book, Sin and Salvation. I want you to think about this. Meanwhile, we should emphasize again one of the greatest and most serious confusions of religious history is the failure to make clear distinction between what one must do to be moral and what one must do to be saved. Being moral does not make you a Christian, and there's a different way to be moral than there is to be saved. And that's what he's making reference. And that's what Jesus was making reference here. Put your focus on what counts that gets results. Don't focus on other things as much as right as it seems to be. So he's focusing, and that's why he was perturbed at Philip. You don't get it. He said, you don't understand. You see me and you haven't seen the Father? Philip was saying, I think the Father is different than you. Maybe he thought, yeah, he's up there with a branding stick, and Jesus is trying to kind of mediate. It's the attitude of some. And I have to admit, I had that attitude myself. Okay, so our lesson concentrates today. The, Hebrew, the book, book of Hebrew was written to who? Pardon? New Christian Hebrews, Christian Jews. And they had a proud heritage, right? We talked about that. And now the maybe in a synagogue, which they did for a while before they were thrown out, or lay meeting in a little house. But before there was the temple, the glamour, how awesome it was. I tell you, I, uh, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was working for a company called Commercial Credit, and I was a finance manager for them. And I won't go through that story. A lot of learning in that area from a, from a uh, Christian perspective. But one woman who was our treasurer, she was a Catholic. And she said to me, Chuck, she said, why did you become an Adventist? And uh, I said, well, I just studied the Bible and I saw some things in there that really interested me and I thought were worthwhile and were beneficial to me. And as I studied, I found that the Adventist church seemed to fit what I was studying from Scripture. I didn't have anybody make that decision. I made it for myself. And I believe that God gave me insight that I hadn't known before. Now, you know, before my wife was a Christian at the time, I was not. And so forth. And so I turned the question on her. Sometimes the best answer is another question. Okay? So I said, well, why are you a Catholic? And she kind of stopped for a minute and says, well, when I walk into the church, it is so glamorous. It is so beautiful. 
Our ceremony is so humble and so spiritual. People are quiet when they come into the sanctuary. It's going on and on and on. Just, that's why I'm Catholic. Oh, okay. I was in Cherokee, Iowa. Anybody know where that's at? You know Cherokee, Iowa? How's that possible? <laughs> Some people don't even know what Iowa is. <laughs> oh, can you tell us what town? Well, Red Oak. I, no, let me tell you, I'm, so you know that I'm being truthful. Red Oak is not far from Omaha, and it's right on the border of Nebraska, correct? I've been in Red Oak a few times, so forth, so good. Well, Cherokee, Wyoming is maybe about the size of Red Oak, huh? would you say? Close? Everything's close in Iowa. <laughs> some people think it's the capital of some state. I mean, you know, but anyway, we was in Cherokee, Wyoming, and I was working with a fellow consultant, and she worked for me, and we had, uh, she wanted some help on a situation with connectivity uh, for interfacing. And so I went with her to help her with that. And after we were done, we had a few minutes, she said, Chuck, I want to take you to the Catholic Church here in Cherokee. And I said, okay. So we went in there, and she was Catholic. And we had a lot of great discussions. It was a wonderful thing. And we walked in there, and I will tell you, as that bookkeeper said at Commercial Credit, it was awesome. It was beautiful. It was absolutely gorgeous. And did I feel inspired? Yes, I did. It, was, it, it really appealed to me from an outward perspective. Of course, the confession uh, booths on both sides weren't all that great uh, and so forth. And uh, St. John on one side and St. Bartholomew on the other and that kind of thing. But it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. And so... It doesn't matter what kind of a church we, or facility that we have, whether it's a nice one like this, or whether it's in a home. The key is, are we learning to know God? Okay, so the Hebrews, the Jewish converts were thinking about all this. They were being persecuted at the time. They think, you know what? It's a little tempting to go back to the synagogue. You know, George is still there, and Tom, I miss them. And the rabbi keeps dropping by and so forth. And, you know, do we really want to go through this? What are they really saying? Is Jesus any better than the prophets? Is Jesus any better than Moses or our father Abraham? That's what Paul was trying to address in the entire book of Hebrews. Jesus is superior in understanding and knowing God. Do you agree with that? Okay. So he had to convince them of that. And so, let's go to our next slide. No, let's go backwards. There we go. Jesus asked them, and the question is, I can't even read it. Uh, why does Jesus present a better representation of who God is than the prophets of old? All right, you're on. Why is Jesus a better representation? What is it about him that makes him better and helping us to understand who God is? And I just lost a mic. <laughs> George, we got another one? No, it's all right. What happened to that mic? <laughs> just disappeared. Well, anyway, why is Jesus superior to what they had in the past? It's not that hard, right? Tim says it's not that hard, but he's not saying anything. All right. When we look at the sanctuary, what he's done as far as his ministry, as far as his intercession work as a high priest. Okay. You know, that alone entails a lot. Does. Why is he better? Well, the priest of that time, Levi, would die. Jesus Christ would never die. Oh. Somebody's got it. Go ahead. Well, you, would you mind repeating that? Because they didn't all hear that. And then I'll make sure you said the same thing. So. Anyway, I can talk loud enough. She's going to turn it on. Good now? There we go. So, yeah, as far as his work as high priest goes, you know, the Bible tells us that the priests, you know, they only lasted a certain length of time because they would die. Well, Jesus never dies, therefore... He's better and higher as far as his yeah, priesthood. He's a better high priest. That's right. Yeah. So that's just one aspect. 
Okay. I mean, well, many. let's pick up on what he just said. The sanctuary truth. Uh, and when I uh, was dating my wife, I remember I wanted to go to the movies and she wanted to go to church. Remember that? So I ended up going to church uh, <clears throat> by default uh, and so forth. And so we never heard in all those Sunday services that we went to, I never heard of the sanctuary. Not mentioned. And yet the sanctuary is a large part of the Old Testament. Why would that be? Tim brought it up, and he brought an important point is because the sanctuary is representative as plan of salvation. Plan of salvation. Now, it was somewhat not complete because Hebrews tells us it's not the blood of animals that saves us. It is the blood of Christ. So they had to understand the symbols. Have you ever thought, why didn't Jesus just come right after Adam and Eve's sin? We forget the sanctuary thing. Have you ever really asked that question in your own mind? Why don't we just speed the process up a little bit? Of course, Tim wouldn't have been born, and neither would have I. But Jesus would have come and gone by now. So maybe it's good in a way that he's held off from that perspective. But why didn't he just do it? To be I don't know if we can answer that question. Maybe you can. Yeah. Oh, over here. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to hold the mic because George said I have to oh, wipe okay. it off in between, so I thought this it might be easier. doesn't transmit that way. It's fine, though, uh, because God needs to be vindicated, and Satan sinning in heaven showed his true character, but the angels were so innocent they could not see that. So if God would have been exacting in that moment, then they would have been very afraid of God. So he had to let Satan's full character come through fruition, and this is why we're here now. And now the, all the rest of the worlds have seen it. God is getting ready to close this, this show out, and, uh, and Satan is, has been shown for what he really is, that he, it is not God that is exacting, that is horrible. It is actually Satan. So that is the main reason that I believe that it, it had to be had to follow through. It had to go through from the beginning to the end. It couldn't just end in heaven. It couldn't just end in, in, at the garden because if it would have ended at the garden, then that means what does God do? I mean, ask, you, ask yourself this question. What if Adam wouldn't have gone along with Eve? What would have happened then? Would God have given well, him a, God, happen, but, would God have given him a new wife? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that, what that's would have happened the point. then? Yeah, uh, and you know, Adam probably, we, I don't know if we'd been much different, you know, it's it kind of a love-hate relationship though, when he says, first of all, in his mind, probably that she sinned, and, I have, and God's going to take her. So he's afraid that, that separation which she enjoyed, but then as soon as God finds out, and says, oh, this woman you gave me, this woman, not his wife, this woman that you gave me. So it's uh, <laughs> kind of that kind of situation. But... The point is, isn't it, that Jesus is superior because he fulfills everything in the sanctuary. He's our high priest. Okay, we don't have to have Jesus dying every year. He died once and for all. When Jesus says it's finished, that's what he meant. It's done. It's over. I have paid the price for past, current, and future sin. It's over. It's done. I've taken care of that problem. And so forth. But he's still our high priest because... We're still walking through life and we still need a mediator. I will caution you today of some things that are going around that there will come a time in our history before Jesus comes that we won't need a mediator. That is a blatant lie. Any man that says he can sell out sin is a liar. The Bible says that. It's very strong about that. Because once we stop using Jesus as our mediator, we lose our connection with heaven. Do you agree? So we're thankful that we have him. I'm going to skip over because we're not going to make it. Uh, I'm going to go in Hebrews 8, 4. Who brought up the deal about the angels? You did. All of a sudden, we find that, um, gee, I hate to lose all this, but we'll never get to it. So we're just going to have to go on. Jesus was our creator is another thing, right? He created us. That makes him better than Moses. That makes him better than Abraham, right? He is our creator, all right? But I want to go to verse 4 uh, in Hebrews 8. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, here, let's go here. 
Why does Paul switch gears in verse 4 and says, he's even better than the angels? I mean, he's like out of the blue. I'm thinking, what, what, what's the point? I'm going to give you another answer real quick, and then we can talk about this for briefly. And this comes from Matthew Henry's concise commentary. Anybody have a Matthew Henry's commentary? What is that thing, 17th century? I think so. It still has some good stuff in it. Here's what he says. Many Jews had a superstitious or idolatrous respect for angels. They had received the law and other tidings of the divine will by their ministry. They had looked upon them as mediators between God and men. There's always someone trying to put a mediator other than Christ between us and the Father. And some went so far to pay them a kind of religious homage or worship. Thus it was necessary that the apostles should insist not only on Christ being the creator of all things, and therefore of angels themselves, but as being the risen and exalted Messiah in human form to whom angels and authorities and powers are made subject. Isn't there something in the commandments that tells us about worshiping things even in heaven? Isn't that true? The earth below and the heaven above. No images, because we have a tendency to worship images like the mult mixed multitude and the golden calf. Do you know they were worshiping God then? Did you know that? You say, oh, they were worshiping a heathen God. No, 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 no. They were worshiping God, but they used the image of Baal. They used something in addition to what God asked. That's why idols are dangerous. We worship in spirit. So, let's go on here, because there's some other points. Uh, well, we should come to this. Another reason that Jesus, as it tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 1, excuse me, uh, 8, verse 1, is that, uh, 1, verse 1, is that he sustains all things by his power. Not only did he create us, what else does he do? Pardon? He just keeps things going. His power does all of that, right? And we might add along with that, it's just that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him, all things were what? Made. Jesus was the active force of the Trinity, or the Godhead, in the process of creation. But there's one other thing. If He was a creator, what good thing is that justifies and makes it possible for us to be Christians? If He was the creator, what else can He do when it comes to creation? He created, recreated us. If he has the power to do one, he has the power to do the other. Would you agree? And so forth. So, what was the key? Every time I read the books of Paul, which is most of the New Testament, one lady one time says, well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I like to read the New Testament, but I, hate, I don't like, she said hate. I hate Paul. I said, well, you just cleaned out three quarters of the New Testament. There's not much left, Right? and so forth. So Paul has a, a great impact on the New Testament. And the fact, if I think of Paul, I think of one word when I think of Paul and his ministry and his subject matter. One term sums up everything he said and did from the time of his conversion to the time of his death. What would you say? There are other answers. So, pardon? Similar to Martin Luther. And isn't it easy? The Reformation was founded on the very principle and the foundation of Christianity. Righteousness by faith. That's why we have trouble in our church with it. Because the devil does not want us to understand that. He doesn't care if you go to church. He doesn't care if you go to midweek service. He could care less. As long as you don't believe in that. He knows that is the, that's the end of the line for him with you. And that's why it is an issue in the church, because it is an issue of good and evil. Don't ever give that up. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they have a PhD and whatever. Don't ever give that up. That was the theme of Paul. It was the theme of Christ. Jesus came into the world to save the world, right? And so forth. And he said, hey, there's only one way. You need to know me. Spend your time on knowing me. You say, well, my conduct's bad. It'll change. I promise you, but don't be focusing on that first. Focus on knowing me. Take time.
time for prayer and secret prayer. That's where intimacy begins. Okay, and we want to encourage each other. Well, say, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I don't have things to pray about. Get a book, write them down. People that are hurting, people that are sick. Wanna, you start getting a list, you won't run out of things. Okay, the boss will be calling you and say, I'm still an hour and a half in prayer, I got two items to go. Right, and so forth. So God wants us to know him. Yes. That's true. That's what the Holy Spirit does, right? He even mingles with our prayers so that they're acceptable to God. Okay, God does everything to make it right for us, and so forth. I was going to go further. Does that bell mean we have 20 more minutes? <laughs> I like this guy. I'm telling you. No, I think we got five, right? Five minutes. Remember uh, what Pastor told Tim? He told this to me, but he did you, that if you go over, you're listening to the sermon in the forum. All right, let's go on real quick. I want to just cover... And Ilya, by the way, if you get a chance, Christ Object Lessons about the king who went out with an invitation and they had this great wedding feast and people rejected and finally went to the streets and byways and they came in and everybody wore what? Except one. A white robe, which is, this is the righteousness of the saints. Because you see, you have to be righteous. But then she goes on to say, as the scriptures do, that that is really the righteousness of Christ. That means these people know God intimately that's why they have that throne and the day comes and we take our crowns off and throw them at Jesus feet we mean it we don't deserve to be here but you deserve to be worshipped for what you've done for us would you agree okay we got two more minutes and I want to know about the fear of God because people use that as an item of evangelism and that's the wedding let's get over there the fear of God is the beginning of the wisdom of God, but perfect love casts out fear. Now this comes from an article I read, and I've read various items, but I like this one, let's see what you think. The fear that perfect care, love casts out is the fear of God's judgment. Now isn't that an interesting statement? Because people use the judgment, even in our own church, to create fear. Now don't get me wrong, there is a judgment. But it can be used wrong, and so forth. Look at verse, 1 John 4, 18. What does perfect love do? Fear that is based on punishment is bad. It says so. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. It is true there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, but I'll tell you this. Romans chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You know what that means? There is no judgment of condemnation. You do not have to worry about that. You don't have to be concerned about that. And yet we run around with that. You cannot give the gospel of Christ running around with the fear of God that you don't know if you're there or not. You cannot give the gospel. Can you imagine trying to show the joy of Christ, what he's done for you, and you're not sure? What does that present as a witness? And they summed up it, in, in, but you know what? That's the hardest thing for us as a people. I'm not just talking Adventists, I'm talking Christians in general. It is the most difficult thing for us to accept, even though it's a pleasant thing. It is hard for us to accept. I have read about people such as Billy, Sonny, and others that late in their career, and they're down and they're doubting. It wasn't their habit, or you know, habitually, but at times the devil will play that doubt game. And you know what? Hey, if you say, I'm not where I need to be, I don't know if I'm saved, go to the throne of grace and make it right. Right? Jesus says, if any man cometh unto me, I'll do what? Cast him out, throw him out the door? What does he say? Any person who comes to me is welcome at the throne of grace. And we say, Lord, I have this issue, I like this sin, or I have this, I got this problem. Do you believe he, if you're honest with him, and you stick with it, that he will give you the power to deal with that? He will. Now for Samson, it took a few days. Daniel seems like he got the picture in a couple, right? But the thing is, it shows God's patience with us. And we need to be patient with one another. And so as we close today, I'm going to leave you with a great, great, evangelist Charles Spurgeon, and here's what he says. There is the natural fear which the creature has of its creator, 
because of its own insignificance and its maker's greatness. From that we shall never be altogether delivered. With holy awe we shall bow before the divine majesty even when we come to perfect and glory. The awesome of God, the omnipotence of God will never go away. But it is not one based upon fear of punishment, but based upon respect and knowing who God is. That's the type of fear that God asks. So anyway, thank you very much for being with us. I think we're on time. Looks like I'll be able to sit in the sanctuary today and so forth. Thank you for being here today and I uh, pray we'll see you next week. And my brother Tim will cover all the mistakes that I made next week and so forth. So let's bow our heads and uh, leave today. Uh, Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. How great is the gospel and how hard it is for us to accept even the very basics. But we give thanks for your patience and your goodness. We pray today that everyone here has the peace that you give. That because we have been justified by faith, we have peace with you. And if that's not the case in some hearts today, we pray that you're here for a reason. And that you can go to the throne of grace. You can trust God in what he says. You can trust his promises. It's okay to not trust yourself. And so we pray, Lord, again for and give thanks for everything you've done for us. We pray the Sabbath will be one that will be one that will be memorable, that will lead to know you better. Is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much.